All right. Good morning, folks. Um, we're going to get started now. I'm sure we'll have another handful of people who trickle in in the next few minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, so today we are going to be going through a number of kind of consumer electronics trends um, using data pulled out of the similar web platform. So we're going to cover just a couple of kind of high level industry trends um, in, a, in a kind of macro trends way. In part two, we're going to talk about some interesting industry projections around kind of the projector space. Um, a lot of the data you're going to see here today is from Amazon um, using the similar web shopper intelligence platform, um, which allows us to get some really, really awesome granular metrics about revenue, search data, market share from Amazon. So you'll be seeing a fair amount of data from that platform, as well as kind of our traditional similar web pro platform, um, encompassing some, some web and traffic data from, from across the internet. Um, we're also going to be taking a look at kind of the, the story of VR, the rise of Facebook um, Meta's monopoly in that space, as well as talk about kind of the future of video game streaming, where some of the kind of key gaming players sit um, as of today, and, and look at some interesting trends that we're seeing on Amazon in the gaming space. Um, we'll follow all that up with just a couple of quick key takeaways, as well as some chances for you all to ask some questions and, and some Q&A. Um, so who am I? My name is Nathan Platnick. I'm the industry manager. Um, covering retail and CPG with a focus on consumer electronics here at SimilarWeb. Um, I cover a handful of different industries within that, as well as the kind of gaming space. Um, so you'll see insights from across those categories here. So I wanna start with a couple of high level macro trends that we're seeing in the consumer electronics space um, with a special focus on, on Amazon. So starting, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the notion of industry consolidation. And I think one of the really interesting things we see in the consumer electronics space is a relatively high level of consolidation and really strong success from the couple of hand, from the handful of kind of key electronics players on Amazon. So if we look at some of our largest categories by revenue on Amazon, um, what this chart is showing us here in the blue line is showing us the percentage of revenue in that category that is owned by the top three brands. And in the orange, it's showing you that same metric for 2021. So I think what's really interesting about this is when we look on Amazon, Amazon's really an ecosystem that tends to benefit a lot of smaller, lower cost brands um, across a number of retail CPG categories. And, and usually what we see because of that is a high level of fragmentation, right? Not a lot of brands owning a huge percentage of a certain space. Um, that does not necessarily hold true in consumer electronics. When we look at some of our top revenue categories, things like cell phones, televisions, um, in cell phones, for example, about 76% of revenue on the platform is just coming from those top three brands. And we think what's interesting to note here across all of these is we're seeing a little bit of a decline year over year in that consolidation. In something like televisions, um, we see about a 10% decline, a lot of that coming from a handful of the really kind of newer, smaller, lower cost manufacturers that have started to see success on the Amazon platform. This is a dynamic we'll touch on a little bit more when we get to the uh, projector story. Um, I see a hand raised. Is um, are folks able to just to confirm? Everyone's able to to kind of hear. Um, if there are questions about the actual content itself, I think we'll come back to those towards the end during the Q and A. So feel free to throw any questions you have in the chat, unless it's a kind of technical question um, around not being able to hear. Um, okay. Moving on, I really want to talk about one of our largest players on the platform a little bit, which is Apple, right? Obviously, Apple is one of the largest monopolies we have in tech. They control huge percentages of revenue in the headphone space, the obviously the smartphone, tablet, laptop space as well. Um, but I think what's really interesting when we look at Apple on Amazon over the last year or so, we actually see a contraction in their revenue and market share across a number of key categories. Um, and I think what's most interesting is we actually see this as a biggest challenge for them going into Q4 of last year. So what we have in this chart here in the blue is we have Apple's quarterly revenue in 2020. Um, and in orange, we have 2021, right? So we see a slightly stronger Q1 relative to Q1 of 2020. Um, but when we look year over year, revenue has been shrinking for Apple across the board. Um, when we look at Q4, this is kind of the place of largest concern, right? We see about 1.8 billion in revenue in 2020 down to about 1.3 billion in revenue in 2021, which is a drop of about 25% year over year. Um, why is this such a big deal, right? Apple, obviously a monopoly in the space, but their premium positioning in the market generally um, leads them to have a very strong Q4 historically, right? This is a brand that's 
one of the most popular kind of gifted brands. They often sell products that are really popular around Christmas, and it often coincides with some of their refreshes of key product lines. So to see this kind of market contraction means that the door is being opened for other players on Amazon, um, right? So when we think about that kind of story of industry consolidation, this really ties very interestingly into that because what we're seeing is not only that there's increased kind of competition, increased fragmentation across all of Apple's categories, um, which we saw a couple of slides ago, but also that the brand is kind of struggling to grow on Amazon, right? It's struggling to grow on the largest consumer electronics marketplace in the world. Um, and part of that is they're seeding ground in a couple of key categories due to a kind of widely perceived product, stag eh, product stagnation. Um, so when we look across a couple of their key categories, in the blue, we have their market share in 2020. In the orange, we have their market share in 2021. Um, and in the green and yellow, we have Samsung's comparative numbers over that same time period. So I think it's really interesting to take a look at that smartwatch and tablet market share. Obviously, we see that massive decline in headphones. We see just a small jump there for her, um, Samsung. In headphones, what we're really seeing is increasingly um, consumers are turning to some of those lower cost brands, some of those smaller Chinese brands um, that are offering a lot of the competitive features that a product like AirPods wants offered at a much reduced price. Um, when we look at things like smartwatches and tablets, I think it's really interesting to call out Samsung here because Samsung has been considered to be kind of iterating and innovating on their product assortment in these categories at a much more rapid rate. I think. Um, you know, when we look at the kind of buzz around Apple's recent launches of Apple Watch Series 7, um, the new iPad Air, increasingly those product lines are viewed as stagnating. Um, well, Samsung is kind of introducing newer products with new features, um, and we see that brand really gaining market share. So, for example, right, almost a 10% increase year over year in Samsung's market share in, um, in smartwatches, almost corresponding exactly to kind of Apple's decline in that category. Um, and similarly in tablets, about an 8% jump in share of revenue in that category um, and a similar decline there for their tablet market share as well. Obviously the headphones category is much larger on Amazon um, than either the smartwatch or tablets category. So um, Apple still manages to really control a plurality of revenue in that category, but not quite the juggernaut we saw them as a year ago, right? They've been introducing a couple new products on the fringes of the AirPods line none of which have kind of been able to really recapture that initial hype, that initial explosion of revenue um, and that huge early market share in the headphone space. So I think when we think about Apple, right, you know, as these charts show, they're, they're still in a really strong position. They're still in pole position across a number of these categories. Um, but we do start to see that market share really waning. Um, and I think what this highlights again is that ability for some of these newer, smaller brands, obviously, you know, Samsung as well, some of these larger players, in headphones, we see a brand like Sony really starting to grow their market share, especially in the over-ear space. Um, but it also suggests that some of these smaller brands are really starting to eat into market share um, for the larger players like Apple. Um, and I think what's really interesting to kind of tie into this is the trend around the kind of growth of certain Chinese brands and sellers, the trend around delisting that we saw last summer. So we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, moving on from Apple, I wanted to highlight a couple of interesting trends around keyword search that we saw on Amazon in 2021. So here what we see is a breakout of some of our fastest growing high volume branded keywords on Amazon, as well as the um, traffic these terms drove to PDP. Um, so here up top, we have these branded terms and in the bottom, we have our non-branded terms. So a couple of key themes emerging here as we look at these terms, right? a huge and growing focus on higher powered laptops with a focus on gaming, right? We see things like Lenovo's Legion 5 series. We see MSI gaming laptops. We see specific high-end processors like the Ryzen 7 um, really growing massively. In some cases, up to 500% year over year growth in search volume for some of these terms. We see a huge focus similarly, not only on kind of gaming computers themselves, but on gaming peripherals and accessories. Um, we saw massive growth in the gaming keyboards category this year. We see a huge growth in specificity in searches for terms like you know, Japanese keycaps, RTX 3060, um, another kind of another processor term. Um, so the gaming laptop space, uh, another trend that we'll touch on in just a second, um, really, really growing like wildfire this year. I think another one that we see really growing as well, both in the branded and non-branded category is the growth of interest in uh, home security cameras. We see searches for things like the WISE camera as well, both a branded, both the kind of generic branded WISE camera as well as a specific model growing over 500% year over year. We see searches for things like outdoor wireless security cameras, dash cameras, film, um, 
all sorts of kind of home security devices. So we see this category really growing as well. Another one I want to call out is this term around USB-C and USB hubs, right? So as we know, kind of from following the consumer electronics space, devices are increasingly shifting from USB-A to USB-C. Um, it's a trend that's really started to happen in earnest over the past year. Most new laptops and a lot of new devices being sold exclusively with USB-C. So when I see this massive growth in searches for USB-A to USB-A to USB-C converters or USB-C hubs, what that indicates to me is we're kind of on the precipice of a of kind of a massive upgrading cycle, right? Folks are upgrading their devices to these new USB-C devices. They're looking for that backwards compatibility. So I think this is really a trend to keep an eye on as well is this massive growth in interest for things like USB-C indicates that folks are upgrading their laptops, upgrading their accessories, um, upgrading their tablets to these new devices. Great. Um, now we wanna move on to talking a little bit about some of those Chinese brands we referenced earlier, right? So really interesting to look at kind of the massive growth of some of these smaller Chinese brands across a number of categories, right? I think a lot has been made of the success of these Chinese brands, given the marketplace nature of Amazon, given the relatively low barrier to entry um, to get into some of these categories. So when we look at something like a cables and interconnects, um, which includes things like, um, which includes things like USB cables, um, converters as well, we see in this category, which tends to be pretty low cost, that market share for these Chinese brands is nearly at 60%, right? So when we look at this cluster of categories up here at the top, um, here on this uh, x-axis, we are just looking quarter over quarter from 2020 to Q4 2021. Um, we see in a lot of cases pretty massive growth in some of these um, pretty low cost categories, right? These are categories where the unit price is $10, $15, um, and where the primary value prop that some of these smaller Chinese brands are adding is that they're coming in dramatically under cost of some of the kind of historic players in that space, your Logitechs, your Belkins. Um, so in a lot of cases, surpassing 40, 50% revenue. In these categories down here, which are headphones, including earbuds in the light blue and over-ear headphones in the yellow, we see that these Chinese brands have actually had a slightly harder time cracking into some of these slightly more kind of high consideration categories, right? Folks are a little more, you know, they're a little more consider, they're giving a little more consideration to a headphone purchase versus something that's a little more disposable like a USB hub or a USB charger. Um, but I think what's interesting to see is we see this fluctuating around at kind of 10, 15, 20% um, and not experiencing quite the same growth. So I think what we see so far is that these Chinese brands have had a ton of success in breaking into these low cost categories, but less success into breaking into these kind of higher cost, higher consideration categories. And if we think back to our kind of slides on Apple, right? Earbuds are a category where Apple has, you know, the AirPods product has really, really been one of the dominant players in that category, inspired a ton of copycats, um, but also inspired a lot of the kind of big brands, your Sony's, your Samsung's, um, to really dramatically kind of reinvest in that true wireless earbud space. Um, so a lot of that has kind of eaten into the ability of these Chinese brands to gain substantial market share. I think really important when we're talking about the success of these Chinese brands on Amazon as well, is to think about that kind of mass delisting that happened in 2021. So for those who aren't familiar, um, in the kind of mid summer spring of 2021, Amazon went through and really cleaned up a lot of these kind of smaller Chinese brands that were really circumventing some of their rules for sellers. So I think in a lot of cases, what we saw is that some of these brands were offering in exchange for positive, we're offering gift cards or monetary compensation in exchange for positive reviews of their products, which is obviously a practice that Amazon really frowns upon. So we saw a massive kind of delisting of some of the largest Chinese brands on the platform, brands that had kind of started to transition even to becoming, you know, somewhat household names in the consumer electronics space, particularly brands like Aki, Rav Power, Tautronics. Um, so what we're seeing here in this chart is the percentage of revenue that these delisted brands owned in the space before they were delisted. Um, and then obviously when we get to that Q3 2021, that revenue plummeted to zero. But I would call attention to kind of that late 2020, early 2021 period, where in the chargers and adapter space, brands that are no longer available on Amazon owned as much as 30% of the revenue in that category. Even in some of the categories we've been talking about before, right, as categories that have been harder for those Chinese brands to crack into like earbuds and headphones, these delisted brands in some cases owned as much as 20% of that category revenue. So we see that kind of gradual fall off as more of those brands were delisted, culminating in that kind of late summer 2021 overall delisting.
Now, I think what's really interesting about this, it would be easy to assume that once these brands disappeared off the Amazon platform, they were kind of gone for good. But I think a really interesting trend and one that we really want to keep an eye on um, is understanding how these brands that kind of existed exclusively on the Amazon system, ecosystem, have managed to transition themselves into becoming kind of D2C players in their own right. So what we have here on this chart is in the blue, what we see is the revenue that these brands generated in 2020 and 2021 before their delisting. Um, and then the year over year growth in the orange to their brand.com or D2C brand site. So the way we would look at that is, so for a brand like Aki, right? Aki did about 175 million in revenue in 2020 and 2021. In 2021, after that brand was delisted, traffic to their site increased 135%. So this brand very quickly, they built out a D2C experience. Um, once, their, once their brand was delisted from Amazon, obviously the bulk of their revenue came from Amazon, um, but they were able to really quickly kind of pivot this strategy towards building these brand owned D2C experiences. And in some cases, when we see a brand like Vankio, like Aki, um, even some of these others, which experience smaller growth like Vava and Tautronics, um, these are brands that were doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue and have actually managed to attract a sizable percentage seemingly of that audience to at least consider their D2C offerings. So what this tells me is that these brands, you know, that were once kind of anonymous, that were once really leveraging a lot of non-branded search behavior um, to drive users to these low cost products um, are actually having some success in creating a level of brand affinity um, that previously we wouldn't have really thought possible for these Amazon native brands. So. This trend I think is really just starting to emerge and it's one we're gonna really wanna keep an eye on um, because this actually poses a threat to a couple of different players. It poses a threat to Amazon if these brands can exist um, successfully off the Amazon ecosystem. It also poses potentially a threat to some of the larger players um, on Amazon, right? If these, are, if these consumers were once folks who would have bought from some of these low cost brands are now no longer seeing those products on the platform um, are shifting over to some of our largest kind of industry leaders, our enterprise brands, um, will the existence of these brands DTC sites actually manage to lure some folks away from some of the kind of larger power players in the space um, back to their brand owned DTC experiences? So I think a really important trend to kind of keep an eye on over time. All right, um, moving into a kind of different topic and honing in on a single um, actual really fast growing product category. Um, I'd be curious for folks to just think to themselves, when they think about projectors, right? You know, and I'm talking about projectors that can play TV content and project it onto a wall, right? If you were to think about that category, what percent of the revenue of televisions, right? One of our largest Amazon categories, would you imagine that projectors on Amazon are doing, right? You think 10%, 20% projectors, a kind of small niche category. Um, what if I told you that it was actually closer to 70%? So last year, when we looked at the revenue generated by projectors on Amazon, projectors did almost 70% of the revenue of televisions on Amazon, um, which I think is a pretty eye-popping number when we think about kind of the, what we think of as the relative prominence of those two categories and the importance of those two pro categories on the Amazon ecosystem. Um, I think really notably, right, the projector category grew by almost 50% year over year from about 834 million in revenue in 2020 to about 1.2 billion in revenue in 2021. Um, well, televisions grew still at a healthy 12%, but at a much, much slower clip. So I think what we expect is that if we continue to see this revenue for projectors grow at even kind of a half of the rate it did last year, we could actually start to see revenue from projectors on Amazon surpass televisions in 2022 or 23. Um, I think what's so interesting to contextualize this with is 2020 was actually a banner year in terms of revenue for projectors on Amazon. So if we think about why projectors were so popular in 2020, um, a lot of that is due to kind of change in behavior and lifestyle coming out of COVID. So if we think back to, to early 2020, folks were kind of fearful of being inside with friends. They were looking for ways to kind of share content and enjoy things together. Um, so we saw this massive growth in interest in these low cost projectors as a way for folks to sit outside with their friends um, and enjoy content together rather than congregating around a TV. Um, what's really interesting is this massive year-over-year -year uptick in revenue is actually due to an entirely different trend. Um, what we're looking at here is the growth in search volume for different types of searches around projectors. So I'll start here at the, at the far left. So 
year over year, 2020 to 2021, we saw that a 12% growth for projector searches that connotate premium. Um, and those are these blue terms here on the left. These are things like ultra HD, ultra short throw, which are the projectors that you can place just a couple inches from a wall um, and 4K, right? These are features that folks used to have to buy super premium TVs in order to have access to and are now increasingly coming from coming to um, and available on projectors. When we look at the terms that grew, that shrunk the least, shrunk the most year over year, we see in most of that decline is coming from these low end terms, right? Things like portable, things like Pico, things like outdoor. So what this indicates to me is those kind of cheap low end projectors that were designed for folks to kind of sit outdoors and watch together um, are actually declining in interest year over year. And what's really increasing in interest are folks who are actually looking to replace their super premium high end TVs with projectors without sacrificing um, quality or feature set um, or convenience. So I think what's really interesting to see here as well is that not only are folks searching for these terms at, a, at an increasing rate, right? Revenue from these types of products is growing exponentially. So when we look year over year, about a 22% increase in the percentage of projectors that include features like 4K, HDR, 120 Hertz, short throw, um, and massive declines for projectors that are these portable projectors and mini projectors. So I think a theme that we'll come back to a couple of times throughout the kind of presentation today is the fact that search volume and revenue or search volume and actual consumer demand don't always equate when we look at the Amazon ecosystem. In a lot of cases, we'll see a huge growth in search volume, um, but no commensurate growth in revenue, which indicates to me that there is a massive amount of interest in a product category, but not necessarily a lot of actual consumer demand for it just yet. So projectors have actually kind of flipped that script to an extent, right? We see this massive growth year over year in interest in these high-end projectors um, when we use search as a proxy for interest. Um, and then we also see a massive growth in the actual unit sales. So the actual purchases that a user is making. Um, and I think this is really interesting, especially when we kind of take a look at some of our top selling products on the platform. So in Q4 2020, our top selling projectors, our top five projectors on Amazon had an average unit price of about $112. In 2021, we saw that about $715. So a near $600 increase um, Q4 over Q4. And I'm using Q4 here because this is the time when we see kind of the most interest in a lot of these key consumer electronics categories, right? Q4, the holiday season, folks are willing to spend a little more money or buying products as a gift. Um, and we've actually gone from seeing some of our kind of lower end Chinese brands, even some that have been delisted, brands like Vankyo, um, which we're offering these kind of hundred or sub hundred dollar projectors, um, being replaced by some of our largest players in the, in the kind of consumer electronics category. So Samsung offering a $1,500, 120 inch 4K ultra HD projector, Epson as well, one of our largest players in that space, um, as well as some kind of mid cost options, your ViewSonics, your Kodaks, but all of these at a dramatically increased price point. So up here in this chart, what we can see is over time, we can just see that massive growth in the willingness of consumers to spend on some of these premium projectors. So we see that kind of low point here at the outset of COVID in Q2 2020, when folks were really buying with price being their number one consideration factor. Um, now through Q4 2021, where folks are actually buying these products as a way to replace the premium TVs that they may once have bought. And I think what's really, really interesting to look at as well is um, from a price perspective, from a price perspective, right? In a lot of cases, users are actually buying a projector which is cheaper um, than they would have to spend on the equivalent TV. So I have this matrix uh, broken out here where we can see for some of these, you know, super premium features like 4K, 120 Hertz, um, about 1100 to $1,500 for a 70 to 80 inch TV. Projectors offering a lot more flexibility in size, portability. Um, a lot of the factors that kind of the modern consumer is really interested in. Can I take this with me on the go? Can I integrate this into my existing home theater setup? Not only are they getting these premium features, they're getting them at a, uh, at a real price savings. And I think it's interesting to see the way this is actually eating into the market share of some of these premium TVs. So when we look year over year at the unit sales of TVs by size, we actually see some contraction in kind of our biggest segment of that category, which has historically been these kind of 50 to 70 inch 
kind of our premium and entry level premium products, um, we actually saw them contract by about 200,000 units year over year. And we're seeing most of that growth coming from these cheaper low end 20 to 40 inch products. Um, and from our kind of ultra high end, our 80 to 100 inch TVs, which we saw pretty exponential growth from, but still represents such a small piece of the category overall. So I think just to kind of wrap up this section, um, I think what we see here is a huge shift in consumer priorities from a cheap low end product to an ultra premium high end product. Um, and we also see kind of massive growth in this category that's starting to really eat into televisions, which has historically been obviously a massive driver for consumer electronics category revenue as a whole, but one of our largest consumer electronics categories on Amazon. So I think this will be a really interesting one to keep an eye on in the coming months and years as we start to potentially see these projectors not only improve in you know, feature set, maybe even some of these high-end features start to come down in price point, um, but also start to supplant TVs as the way a lot of folks are consuming content on a daily basis. All right, we're gonna move now into another really kind of buzzy product category, which is VR. Um, and I want everyone to keep in mind the kind of trend we talked about in projectors, which is we don't always see that consumer demand equates to revenue and or consumer interest, as it were, um, which is we express kind of through search volume, we don't always see that search volume turning into revenue. So I think it's really interesting to contextualize that using this chart. So here in the blue, we see the quarterly search volume for VR terms. Um, and then in the orange, we actually see the revenue from VR products on Amazon. So in 2020, we saw a massive explosion in interest for VR products. Um, you know, 6 million almost searches alone in Q4, but only about 70 million in revenue from the product category as a whole, right? So what that tells me is that the category is, has a ton of interest, but the product offerings on display aren't really yet mature enough for most consumers to consider purchasing. Um, and then we see that dynamic flip almost entirely in 2021. Um, we see, only about, we see kind of a few, we see fewer searches in Q4 2021, but we see this explosion of revenue to almost 270 million. Um, I think when we think about consumer electronics products, uh, uh, important kind of story to keep in mind is always the idea of the iPod, right? The idea that the MP3 category existed long predating the iPod, but it took a product like that to kind of boost that category from its infancy into its maturity. So. VR had that kind of moment in the last 18 months with the Meta Oculus 2. Um, I think a lot has been made of, of Meta's, you know, ambitions around the metaverse, the idea that folks are going to transition to, you know, existing in the metaverse, doing their work in the metaverse, socializing with their friends in the metaverse. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an idea that most consumers have kind of shaken their head at and thought to themselves, this is still too nascent a product category. This is still too nascent an offering. Um, for this to be kind of a serious challenger and a serious, you know, change to the way we, you know, interact with one another. But I think when we think about where Meta is positioned um, in controlling the metaverse, their success with the Oculus is really step one towards that kind of domination. So even if folks are still kind of shaking their head at the notion of, you know, wearing a headset all day and interacting through avatars, Meta has really primed itself to be that number one kind of monopolistic player in the VR space. Um, which really bodes extremely well for their kind of metaverse ambitions. So here I'm combining a couple of metrics to take a look at, you know, the change in the consumer awareness of meta and their relative space in consumer awareness vis-a-vis -vis the entire VR category. So um, in the dark blue here, what we have is branded searches for Oculus um, and how much of the kind of entire VR search landscape that they account for. So in 2019, about 50% of searches for VR were a meta branded term um, or Oculus branded term. Um, this was kind of before that, that meta Oculus rebrand. Um, and we saw that about 22% of non-branded searches, so that searches for things like VR headsets were driving to an Oculus product page. So this is obviously really strong, still owning a majority of searches in the category and driving really strong search volume um, and driving really strong traffic to their PDPs from non-branded terms. Um, but when we look at that evolution over time, Oculus branded terms now account for 80% of the searches in the VR category, right? So when a user is searching for a VR product on Amazon, 80% of the time they're searching for a term like Oculus Quest 2, um, Meta Oculus, right? A branded term. 
only about 16% of all searches in that category are for a non-branded term. So that's things like VR headset, um, some of those really top of funnel um, kind of high volume terms that we would expect to be, you know, even 50% of search volume are just 16% of total searches are those non-branded terms. And even when users aren't searching for non-branded terms, about 55% of non-branded searches are driving to an Oculus PDP. So what this indicates to me is that not only are users searching for Oculus at an extremely high volume to the point where they're really the only player that has substantial market share um, and substantial consumer awareness in the VR space. Some of the kind of previous players that we saw is you know, somewhat, somewhat relevant in the category, your HPs, your Microsoft Hollow lenses, um, they've all but kind of abandoned that category to meta. So when we look, right, from a search volume and awareness perspective, Oculus is the clear leader in the category. Um, and when we look at that revenue over time, we see that Oculus really is synonymous with the VR category, right? In Q4 2021, about 24 million in revenue in the, came from non-Oculus headsets and about 230 million came from Oculus. The entire VR category on Amazon in Q4 was only about 275 million. So, Right when we look at this, about 230 million from Oculus, about 25 million from um, a couple of other players. The remaining, um, the remaining several million is almost exclusively coming from Oculus accessories, headbands, cases. Um, so what this indicates to me is not only are they a, mon a kind of a monopoly in the space the way we've seen a brand like Apple be in a couple of other categories, they're really the end all be all in that category. So. Tying this back to the idea of kind of where we're headed with the multiverse or the metaverse, um, this bodes really well for Facebook getting consumers to make that transition, right? They own the hardware, they own the software, and they own that consumer awareness in the space. Um, so I think as we continue to see this kind of category grow, about 83% of that category revenue to date is coming from, um, is coming from Oculus. Um, and as we continue to see that kind of category expand, as we continue to see consumers increasingly comfortable with the notion of, you know, transitioning more and more of their life to the metaverse and to wearing these headsets for extended periods of time, we see applications move from, you know, more entertainment, video games, um, into more kind of practical applications for communal workspaces, replacing things like, you know, Zoom and video conferencing. Um, we can kind of expect to see Meta's monopoly over the category continue to grow. All right, last story up here is to talk about kind of the future of video games. Um, this year, 2021, or last year now, really should have been a banner year for video games, right? We saw the introduction of the PS5 in late 2020, the Xbox Series X in late 2020, um, the introduction of a new model of Nintendo Switch in, in mid-late 2021. This should have been a landmark year for revenue in the gaming space. Um, but when we look at the categories revenue on Amazon, we actually see that video gaming as a whole really struggled. So in the blue here, we see kind of the revenue from console gaming. In the orange, we see PC gaming. So obviously PC gaming managing to grow year over year when we look at that Q4 revenue, despite some serious challenges in um, supply chain and the availability of different chipsets. Um, but the segment of video gaming that was really hurt, hit the hardest by this lack of availability was those console games, right? Um, I don't need to tell folks who have been paying attention to the space, but it's still near impossible to get your hands on some of these next gen consoles. Um, they're still being snapped up um, and sold on the gray market at you know, staggering rates. Um, and despite a year of availability of these new consoles, video game revenue for consoles in Q4 2021 was down over almost 250 million um, over Q4 2020. So I think what we see here, right, is this is the impact that some of those supply chain issues have really had, right? On a category like this, where there's just a fundamental inability to ship product throughout the year, um, obviously a massive, massive problem for revenue. So when we look at hardware, right, we can see kind of this story really play out. So PlayStation 5, a year-over-year -year growth of, category, of revenue for PlayStation 5 hardware of only about 35%, which may sound like a lot until we put that in the context of Last year, the PlayStation 5 was only available on Amazon for about three months. And this year, despite 12 months of availability, the, cat, the product only grossed, 33 per, um, only grossed about 33% more revenue 
despite four times as much availability. So what that indicates to me is that folks still really can't get their hands on the product. Um, and in a lot of cases, when they are, they're paying a massive premium because they're buying it through a third party seller on Amazon. So on average, folks are paying about seven to $800 for a PlayStation 5 on a product that's about three to 400 MSRP. All console sale revenue was up about 10%, but this is really offset by that growth for PlayStation 5. Um, when we look at Xbox Series X, a tiny bit of growth, but still really hamstrung by that lack of availability. Um, and Nintendo Switch, which has had a kind of incredibly unusual rise to success, where in kind of 2017, when it launched, um, it had kind of middling success in that first year um, and really, really took off in 2019. And then again, during 2020, during the pandemic, um, had this kind of banner year. But despite introductions of new consoles from all of these manufacturers, relatively little growth in hardware revenue on Amazon. Um, and then when we kind of come to that physical software sales, right? So all this is building up to kind of where I think video games are, are going next. And we need to keep in mind, right? PC, PC video game revenue growing a little bit year over year, console revenue really down year over year. Um, when we look at that physical software revenue year over year, down about 12%, which includes PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch, both of which still have an install base of around 45 million users in the US alone. So PlayStation 4, despite that 45 million strong install base, revenue down for that category, 46%. So what this says to me is that folks are just not that interested in buying physical software anymore. They're not buying discs, they're buying increasingly through the kind of storefronts on PlayStation, on Xbox, on Nintendo Switch. Um, consumers are increasingly shifting towards digital. Um, and what's the next step for that? You know, we obviously see that digital, you know, digital gaming is really here to stay and is really starting to supplant that physical software revenue. Um, but the next step for that really seems to be the advent of video game streaming. Um, it's still a pretty nascent category when we actually look at revenue. Um, but we are starting to see is that folks are increasingly switching towards platforms, um, most notably Xbox Game Pass. So Xbox Game Pass, for those that aren't familiar, is a game streaming platform kind of akin to a Netflix, right? You pay a monthly subscription fee and you have access to um, hundreds of games throughout the Xbox library. Microsoft is making massive investments in that space, buying you know, a landmark acquisition with Activision, but also a number of kind of smaller studios and are increasingly starting to offer day and date access to really premium software and really popular titles through that Xbox Game Pass. So despite all this, right, we see these software, sh software sales really shrinking. Um, keep in mind though, that we saw a massive increase in interest for PC gaming. We saw a massive increase in revenue for that PC gaming category in Q4. Um, I wanna keep an eye year over year on this growth in interest in Xbox Game Pass. So in the orange, we have revenue on Amazon from sales of vouchers for the Xbox Game Pass. Um, so that's users buying three, six, 12 month subscriptions to the service. So still relatively low revenue, but we obviously a massive increase throughout the course of the year. Um, the service is increasingly available across a number of devices on PCs, on smartphones, on tablets, as well as on Xbox game consoles. Um, and then we look at actual traffic to the Xbox Game Pass site. So this is the actual portal where you can play these, play and stream these games. We see a explosion, almost double the amount of traffic in Q4 2021, as we saw in Q1 2021. Um, I think this is yet another trend we're really going to want to keep an eye on, right? As we continue to see users who are kind of frustrated by the lack of availability of the gaming consoles shift over to PC, we continue to see growth in the kind of gaming laptop space, especially in the low end gaming laptop space, um, which has been a big focus for brands like HP and Razer, starting to grow kind of the availability of users who are new to PC gaming, who want, um, who want kind of an entry level laptop that meets their needs. Um, I think we'll continue to kind of see revenue and interest in game streaming really grow. We have announcements from Sony that they're continuing to kind of, they're going to kind of continue to grow their cloud gaming offering. Nintendo starting to dip their toes into that water as well. Um, to me, all of this speaks to the fact that this is kind of where gaming is, is headed, right? Moving first away from those console sales onto PC, folks moving away from physical software into kind of downloading um, and owning their software into the cloud, in the cloud. And finally, moving from actually even owning that software into the kind of streaming model that we've seen really, really become um, proliferate across, you know, music and film and really all other sorts of entertainment. So 
to kind of wrap up here, I want to talk about a couple of the key trends and themes we talked about today. Um, as we kind of touched on in the beginning, consumer electronics sees not a ton of fragmentation across its key categories. Um, and most of the revenue on Amazon is coming from just a handful of premium players. But we are starting to see that dynamic shift a little bit. Um, Apple's monopoly in a lot of their key categories is waning, which is potentially opening up white space to both our premium large players like our Samsungs, but also some of our smaller kind of Chinese brands, which are undercutting on price. Um, PC gaming is top of mind, both in terms of revenue and in terms of interest, um, while consoles are floundering amidst just limited availability and limited supply, a trend that we've been told is going to continue throughout 2022 and maybe into 2023. Um, Chinese brands have yet to crack into their premium categories, but increasing interest in their D2C offerings and a growing monopoly in some of these smaller kind of less cost conscious categories um, may indicate that these brands can start to crack into some of those higher consideration categories we talked about, like headphones, um, as well as things like TVs, um, and, and maybe even into laptops and some of our ultra premium categories. Um, projector revenue is on track to top TVs in 2022 or 2023 and represents kind of a massive ecosystem shift um, in terms of some of our largest consumer electronics categories, right? Folks increasingly shifting to projectors to buy some of those premium products and features, um, and even getting a chance to get in on some of those features at a lower price than they once were available with TVs. Um, lastly, VR interest is finally converted from being kind of high interest into high demand. Folks are really starting to buy those products in a serious, massive way. Um, and Meta's monopoly over the category gives them a huge leg up as they start to accomplish their metaverse ambitions. All right, I'm going to throw it to the audience now for any questions or um, comments on the kind of data they've seen today, anything folks found interesting. Um, and one question I would just ask folks to keep in mind is, I'd be curious to think, as you've seen all this data today, think about how some of the shifts we saw from COVID are really actually impacting the consumer electronics space, right? We saw a massive growth in interest in projectors last year, um, and then a completely different shift in that category this year. We saw a huge jump up in interest in VR, likely you know, a lot of folks spending more time at home, looking for new ways to consume media and spend time with friends. Um, and finally, we saw kind of a really interesting shift in the video gaming space. Obviously video gaming during COVID, a massive growth category, um, but the way folks are buying and the kind of products they're buying has really shifted. So would ask folks as they're thinking about kind of their questions, their takeaways from this, to always keep in mind how COVID has kind of accelerated or shifted some of these dynamics in the space. So with that, I will open it up to, uh, to questions. All right, I see we have a question. Um, from Steph on, do you know how much the re-commerce slash secondhand grew in sales? Um, that's a really, really great question. Um, I think we've seen a big growth of Amazon's renewed program year over year in revenue. They've started to add a lot more kind of current models to that program. So I think anecdotally, we've seen that revenue really, really expand year over year. Um, and the marketplace nature of Amazon makes that a, a really big challenger to some of those other brands, right? So I think that's a trend that we don't have strong data for yet, but is definitely one we've seen grow quite a bit. So the interest in renewed products, um, definitely one that I think is here to stay. We had another question around, is the projector trend here to stay? And what is this consumer behavior? Do people still buy these TVs or is this instead of a new TV? Um, so I think some of that we, we answered via the data we saw, but I do think it's probably a little bit of both. I think those low end projectors, um, those kind of hundred to five hundred dollar projectors, are likely in addition to a TV. I think anything you know with portability is likely a an additional product that someone is buying. But you know, if we look at the products that are really trending, like you know Samsung's the Premier, right, a fifteen hundred dollar four K Ultra HD projector, um, that's very likely a replacement for a TV, right? And especially when we consider the fact that. Um, unit sales for some of our premium TVs started to decline this year. I think in a lot of cases, these are folks who are buying that premium projector instead of a TV, converting their kind of home TV setup to more of a home theater setup. So I think likely it depends on which end of that, you know, projector's price spectrum we're talking about. Um, but in a lot of cases, I do think it's a replacement product 
Okay. Um, any other questions that folks had wanted to um, touch on? If not, we can uh, go ahead and end. Um, feel free to throw questions in the chat or just raise your hand and I can unmute you. Okay, we have another question. Given the increased demand of premium projectors, are there any increase in standalone desktop PCs? Um, that's a really great question. I think actually when we look at growth in the PC category, it's almost entirely coming from, uh, from laptops and particularly gaming laptops. Um, it's actually coming from two places, so it's a, it's a good question as well. Um, it's coming from gaming laptops, premium high-end laptops with high-end processors. In a lot of cases, folks are buying those laptops simply for access to things like an RTX 3080 that they can't buy the chip for itself. Um, and it's also coming from kind of the low end as well, things like Chromebooks or products that are just a step up or so above Chromebooks. Um, the increase in standalone desktop PCs is pretty limited. And I think what we see is most of that growth is coming from folks who are trying to create, you know, super high end custom gaming PCs. Um, and Amazon's yet to capture a lot of that revenue. Most of that is happening on more specialized retailers, like a Newegg, like even like a Best Buy. Um, I think when folks are spending that kind of money, they really want that kind of premium experience. They want that category expertise. So I'd be surprised if we don't see Amazon try to expand and improve its offerings in the desktop space. But for now, most of that PC category growth is coming from laptops. Um, couple of other good questions trickling in here. Um, was there anything in the data around consumers not buying due to speed on delivery and offline purchases rather than online? Um, that's a really good question as well. So I think what we did see in a couple of categories, particularly in gaming PCs, we saw a huge increase in product views, but a kind of stagnant conversion rate and sales. So that does indicate to me that we have folks who are not buying because products are unavailable. In terms of speed on delivery, um, Amazon is generally kind of our leader in terms of when we when we see you know speed to delivery. Usually, folks are um, usually when folks are less kind of concerned with delivery speed, they're going to a more specialty retailer where they're getting a more premium experience, but they are having to make that sacrifice of kind of convenience and ease. Um, but I don't think yet we're seeing a ton of folks buying in stores simply because a lot of the product categories we're touching on today, right, that are that are in high demand, um, like gaming PCs, like consoles, um, see limited availability in stores the same way they see in e-commerce. Um, another great question. With Oculus market share at 80% um, in VR, is there a manufacturing inertia to compete or is this going to be a brand takes all? So my hunch is, is really the latter. And I think the reason I think that is really coming from um, all of the brands that we started to see drop out of that category, right? So a couple of years ago, we saw Samsung and HTC and HP and Microsoft all make big pushes into VR, which they scaled back extremely quickly as a, um, which they scaled back extremely quickly as, you know, it became more and more clear that Meta was kind of taking a pole position. So I think where there's a potential for growth is going to be in kind of a more premium space. So when we see brands like, you know, we've, we've seen like Steam um, and Valve have created a, a super premium um, uh, index headset, I think it's called, um, that does have a little bit of an opportunity to compete. But I think the competition is really only going to come in that kind of high end where consumers are, are really making a high consideration purchase. You have really specific design needs. Um, but I think when we look at kind of that, like, two to 500 non-connected. So that's, you know, VR headsets that don't need a PC to function um, or kind of a or PC or gaming console like Sony and, and Microsoft have both had kind of uh, console attached headsets as well. I think that's going to be a brand takes all situation where competing with Meta, who does have that kind of north of 80% market share in that category is going to be extremely difficult, um, especially since their install base just grew exponentially in Q4 2021. Um, I also see a question. What do you think about the future of Anchor Innovations and their brands? Uh, Eufy, Nebula, Soundcore, Anchor Charging. Um, really great question. So 
in a lot of that those charts you saw about kind of the Chinese brands have actually separated Anchor out from a lot of those because they've existed kind of as a player unto themselves. They've had really, really strong success breaking into some of these more premium categories um, to, to Abdullah who asked the questions point. Um, they've done a really good job of innovating, creating a lot of wireless charging solutions. They're not just selling kind of the same, you know, cheap, you know, cheap low end power banks. They're actually selling differentiated products. So I actually think Anchor of all these brands has the biggest opportunity to compete. That said, we have seen them, seen that kind of sound core brand be a lot slower to kind of break into the headphones and audio space simply because they just face so much premium competition. Um, and in a lot of these categories, they're not even winning on price so much anymore, right? Anchor now exists as this interesting kind of middle point where they're less expensive than maybe your Samsungs, your Sonys, your Apples, um, but they're way higher in price than something like, a, you know, than some of these kind of no-name brands um, that live exclusively on Amazon. So I think I would really want to keep an eye there on the growth of their D2C offering. I know they've put a ton of effort into growing their D2C offering. Um, I think they have a big opportunity to compete in the kind of low end projector space and the high end projector space as well, since I know that Nebula offering has been pretty successful. But I think they're a brand that's that's pretty well positioned to win um, if they can continue to kind of do a good job of carving themselves out as the leader in that kind of middle ground space between the premium players and well above kind of those low end players. Um, we have another question about the growth of power banks. Um, I don't have the, the growth numbers for power banks off the top of my head. I think when we took a look at the, um, the kind of percentage of revenue there controlled by, so that's gonna be in, um, that's gonna be in chargers and adapters, I believe. So that's actually one, right, where we see a little bit of a decline um, in the market share owned by Chinese brands. So we've seen a handful of kind of the larger players um, as well as brands like Anchor really grow their offerings in the chargers and adapter space. Um, so I think that the power bank category is one where we'll actually see a little bit of a shift away from some of those low end players, especially since some of them have really been plagued by a lot of quality control issues. Um, it's products that um, have like a really short life that can't really compete with some of the higher end offerings. So I think it'll be incumbent on some of those smaller players, some of those smaller, cheaper players to improve their product offering um, if they want to, if they really want to grow their market share in those space. So I think that's one where folks are, you know, especially when we compare it to something like, you know, USB hubs or even just cables themselves. It's one where we see, um, it's one, it's one where I think we'll see kind of those middle level players like the anchors um, be the most successful. Um, Okay, I think we'll have time for just one or two more questions. So we have a question about what is the smartphone market tendency? Uh, so brand market share. Um, that's a really interesting question, especially because the Amazon cell phone ecosystem has been very strange and it's really complicated by the fact that Apple has not made a full push onto Amazon yet. They're not offering kind of their full product assortment um, on, on Amazon. They don't always launch the new smartphones day and date there. Um, so we see Samsung is extremely strong there, um, as well as some other smaller players and some of the kind of like some of the smaller, newer emergent players like um, OnePlus has been really, really strong on Amazon. Um, but in general, the smartphones that are sold on Amazon tend to be lower cost. So I think that's an interesting one when we talk about kind of consumer behavior. I don't think folks are really yet acculturated to buying smartphones, especially kind of the really high end smartphones on Amazon. Um, so most of the smartphone market share is dominated by. Um, primarily Samsung, we see OnePlus is really strong there as well, um, but it's mostly um, kind of lower end phones, right? We don't see things like, you know, the latest Samsung Galaxy tends not to be our category leader. It tends to be either older phones or some of their kind of, you know, lower end lines that are really successful. But I think we may, you know, especially if Apple continues to kind of see this, you know, stagnation or even decline in revenue coming from Amazon, we may see them really start to rethink their Amazon strategy start to offer more of their premium products on the platform, start to take a more kind of concerted effort um, towards, you know, orienting themselves around, around Amazon as a platform as a whole. In, as a whole. Um, so I would really keep an eye on Apple as we talk about kind of cell phone market share on Amazon. Thank you everyone for sticking around to ask so many great questions. These were really, really interesting. And uh, hopefully this content really resonated. And uh, if you have any questions or you want to schedule some more time, please feel free to reach out. Um, all the, all the uh, info we're sending out following the
webinar should have ways to kind of contact our team here if you want to deeper dive into anything you saw. So thanks a lot for the time, everyone. And uh, yeah, hope to hear from folks soon. Thank you.